thank you for joining us and um a couple things before we do begin the show um again thanks for your patience i really appreciate it really glad you're all able uh, to join us and hopefully now those of you who popped in a few minutes after 501 now you're here for the start of the show so um a few things you might notice in the comments uh, there's a pinned comment uh, posted by Liberty Science Center. Uh, LSE is in the running for Best Science Museum. So if you would like to give us your vote for that, you can follow the link that's posted there uh, at the bottom of the comment section. And uh, we would really appreciate it. We've loved bringing science to our community, uh, both in person and online. So if you'd like to cast your vote, go ahead and uh, do so in those comments. Um, speaking of in person, uh, this weekend at LSE, this is uh, the last weekend for our Wild About Animals uh, kind of festival happening at the Science Center. So if you'd like to come see our Butterfly House, all the awesome uh, animals exhibits and the animal themed laser show, uh, this is your last weekend to do so. Um, so we do recommend that you head online to get tickets for anything like that. And uh, for our uh, monthly planetarium online shows that we have been bringing you for over a year now, which I can't believe, or about, about a year, yeah, Ooh, time flies. We've been doing this for quite a while. Um, this is actually going to be uh, the, I'm actually going to take these off to make it a little easier to uh, see myself. Um, this is going to be our, la our next week. Um, Whew. Next month is going to be the last uh, monthly occurrence of our planetarium online shows. So next month uh, will be kind of the last one that's going to occur every month. It won't be gone forever. We will continue doing planetarium online shows, but they might not happen every single month. Um, so just wanted to let you all know about that and to definitely keep your eyes out on uh, all our social media and our website um, so you can be informed um, when the next planetarium online shows will occur after next month. All right, so now that we have all the technology and everything uh, set up, let's go ahead and start uh, our show touring the May skies. Just double check it again. Looks like my audio is still good. Awesome. So again, thanks for hanging in there with me. <laughs> um, so we're going to uh, start out our show uh, like, like we... Uh, kind of always do taking a look at our sky. So this is the sky um, very soon, right? It probably looks super similar to what you see looking out in out your window right now. We've got, of course, our beautiful star, the sun, but, you know, can't really see anything else when the sun is up. So we are going to fast forward a bit and have our sun go down to take a look at what kind of things we're going to be able to see in the nighttime sky tonight. And it'll be pretty similar all month long. So I'll pause it right here if you want to kind of take a look around that sky, see what you notice, what you might think is up there. Some of you may know a couple of the objects that you'll be able to see uh, in the nighttime sky. And uh, there's actually, uh, there is a planet that's up right now and plenty of bright stars. So you can feel free to share in the chat anything that you might see, anything that you might think is up there. So the first things that I uh, kind of want to talk about are, of course, all of these awesome stars. So stars are things that do change, right? But it takes a whole year to see different stars in our sky. So I'm going to pause real quick. It's going to spin a couple times. And this is to show you that throughout our whole year, as the Earth travels around the sun, we're going to see different constellations in the sky. And that is just basically because whatever is in uh, our background. So there's kind of a way to think about the, the stars in the sky, right? Using your imagination, you might see a lot of pictures, right? And um, astronomers and different people way, way a long time ago, before there were online planetarium shows, before there was TV and video games and all of that kind of stuff, uh, they would look up at the stars, they would see pictures and imagine and, and think of stories that went behind all of those pictures. 
So a group of astronomers decided to pick and divide the sky up into 88 different sections, and each one of those sections is an official constellation of our nighttime sky. So depending on where the Earth is, as it's traveling around the sun, we will see different constellations at night. So these are kind of the constellations that we can see as long as the sun is not in the way. Whatever uh, is in that nighttime part of the sky, those are the constellations we see for that month. And then as the Earth continues on its path around the sun, which we're going to flip back around, whatever constellations are kind of in the area of the sun, we can't see those because they're up during the day. But the Earth, like I mentioned, goes around the sun. It takes a whole year to do that. So as the Earth makes its trip around the sun, we get different stars in the background. So just kind of showing you what constellations we'll see during uh, the nighttime uh, sky uh, right now throughout the year. So just keep that in mind that um, constellations are very reliable. So every May, you'll, we'll see the same constellations um, in our nighttime sky. So for example, I'm going to bring up uh, actually two of my favorite in the nighttime sky. This is Pollux and Castor. They are the two bright stars of the constellation Gemini the Twins. So they're actually pretty easy to see. Pollux um, is very bright. It's the 18th brightest star in our night sky. Um, it is a lot larger than our sun. So Pollux is the star in the head of the twin on the left. Um, that star is much larger than our sun. Um, it's fairly close, about 34 light years away. And uh, kind of cool, even though that's, that's uh, it's considered fairly close. One light year is about 6 trillion miles. So it's very far when you think about um, humans traveling that distance. But it's one of the, the you know, closer objects in uh, the universe. And because it's fairly close to us, um, scientists have been able to discover a planet that's orbiting around it. So in 2006, an exoplanet was found orbiting uh, that star Pollux. So you can just kind of know, looking at this nice bright star in the sky tonight, that there's a planet going around there. Um, Castor, the uh, kind of bluish whitish colored star to the right, um, it's kind of the head of the twin brother. Um, kind of cool about this star, it looks like one star. But there's actually six there. And uh, from our distance, we only see one point of light, but there's actually six stars in that area, which is why you saw that name Castor A. A is kind of the brightest one that we see. Um, but kind of cool, so there's actually six stars there. But uh, to us, it just looks like one point of light. Um, also, if anyone's interested in kind of the stories behind uh, Pollux and Castor here, these are two brothers with the same mother, but Pollux here, his father was Zeus, who was a god. So Pollux is actually an immortal, and Castor had a mortal father. So they're kind of two different twins, but they uh, shared that brotherly love up there, staying together um, in the night sky. So Castor and Pollux, two fairly nice bright stars in the western sky that you will see um, tonight and all month long. And below them is the reddish planet of Mars. So uh, you may have uh, heard about Mars. It's, it's been in our sky for a bit. It's going to be in there for the next few months as well. Mars has also been in the news quite a bit lately. Uh, in February, we might remember, we did a uh, show on this. So if you didn't see it, you can look back on our Facebook page to uh, hear about this landing. But the Perseverance rover touched down in a really specific spot on Mars. This was back in February. It landed in this area, which is called Jezero Crater, which if I pause quick here, I'm going to trace this with my uh, pointer until it looks like uh, this was a river and it emptied into this crater. So uh, scientists think that this used to be a large lake or a large sea. We think it was filled with water um, to help us determine whether that's actually true or maybe is there still water underground? That's another idea that we have. And then going along with water, that might mean there could be life here, or maybe there was life on Mars. So this rover has a bunch of different missions. Um, here's that rover itself. Um, just for a quick overview, 
um, probably, oh, not the coolest, I don't want to say that anything's the coolest because everything is really cool about this rover, but there's a robotic arm on the front here that actually has a drill embedded inside, and for the first time ever, we are going to drill underground on a different planet, collect samples of soil that will be taken back to Earth later, so we can study them in labs, look for presence of water and, and life, so that's going to be really exciting. There's also uh, experiments that are going to try to make oxygen out of the atmosphere of Mars. The atmosphere is really super thin, and it's not really made of oxygen. It's mostly carbon dioxide, which we humans are not able to breathe. So looking for water, trying to make oxygen, those are both very important things for humans. And because Mars does not have either of those and, and other things as well, but Mars is missing a lot of features, a lot of needs for humans. So that's why humans haven't gone there yet, um, in addition to uh, Mars taking about six months to fly there and then six months to fly home again. So there's a lot to do before we get any human beings, um, but that's okay because that's what missions like Perseverance here are helping us to do. Now, also right now, so Perseverance hasn't really done um, any of its big experiments yet because we're kind of giving the spotlight to this helicopter um, for about a month. Um, this helicopter here called Ingenuity has been testing out flying, the capability to fly on Mars. So nothing has ever flown by itself on another planet until Ingenuity did um, last month. So on April 19th, this helicopter took off. We're going to see a real video. So the Perseverance rover took this video of the Ingenuity helicopter. Uh, the area where you're seeing the Ingenuity helicopter fly, it's about to take off here. This area was named Wright Brothers Field, so named after the first uh, flight on the ground on Earth. Now we have also a Wright Brothers Field on Mars. So the first flight that Ingenuity took was just kind of, it took off, it hovered a few feet above the Martian surface, and then it landed down there again. Um, the fifth flight, so since April 19th, uh, this Ingenuity copter has flown four different times. So we're going to see a couple pictures. You can see Ingenuity over there. Um, so Ingenuity is actually going to take uh, its fifth flight tomorrow. It's scheduled to happen tomorrow. So I'm just going to leave it right on this uh, cool kind of selfie. Um, you can see the arm of, of the rover taking a selfie here and kind of looking at you. I just, I think it looks like Wally. I don't know if anyone else agrees with me, but I love when the, the big camera up here looks at you. And then Ingenuity, that helicopter to the side. So um, the fifth flight is scheduled for tomorrow. Um, this one's going to be uh, extra cool because the flight that's scheduled for tomorrow will be the first one-way trip. Up until this point, Ingenuity has just kind of flown around and come back and landed in this same spot, nice and close to Perseverance. But this time, it is going to fly uh, at a record high of 33 feet, and it's going to fly away in the direction that Perseverance is planned to drive. So it's kind of like scouting the path. Um, so that's going to be really exciting. Um, the Ingenuity helicopter doesn't have any scientific experiments per se, but it's really helping us to learn about the possibility for flight on places like Mars, which have a, a super thin atmosphere. It's a hundred times thinner than the atmosphere of Earth, which means there's less particles, less stuff for helicopter blades to interact with. So it's really difficult to fly on Mars what is possible, as we can see, uh, thanks to the Ingenuity helicopter. So, Mars, Castor, and Pollux all in our evening sky. This is uh, right after sunset, so around 9, 9 o'clock or so. Got a nice dark sky. Um, higher up in the sky, kind of above Castor and Pollux, if you kind of follow, follow a, you know, a diagonal line between Mars and and Pollux, we will get to a, a really cool, uh, interesting constellation in our sky. Uh, this is Leo the Lion. Um, it's best recognized in the sky by this kind of backwards question mark here. It's kind of looks like a flipped over question mark. Um, the, the, the question mark here is kind of like the head of 
Leo the Lion got this nice bright star called Regulus. Um, Leo the Lion is one of the 12 labors of Hercules because he had skin that was impenetrable. So we've got Leo the Lion nice and high up there in the sky, kind of in the southwestern sky. And then in the south, I you know, just wanted to bring up a constellation that you may not have heard of before, or you may have, but this is actually the largest constellation of all 88 constellations in the sky. This is Hydra, the water snake. So basically, if you look up uh, at the sky, kind of between the south, reaching over to the southwest, that the whole part of that sky is covered by Hydra water snake. So kind of just an, a cool bit of trivia that you can look for in the night sky. The largest constellation of all 88. It's pretty low in the sky right now. So since I've been talking about constellations, a couple different recognizable things, they're all really um, easy to spot when they're in reference of the super recognizable group of stars of the Big Dipper. So the Big Dipper is actually something called an asterism. It's the seven brightest stars of the constellation Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. So using the Big Dipper, a really common way of the Big Dippers is actually the two stars at the end of the cup. Those point you to the direction of north and the north star. And using that direction of the North Star, that can help you figure out your four uh, main cardinal directions, right? So I've been talking about things like Mars and Castor and Pollux and Gemini and Leo, all in like the west and southwestern part of the sky. So you can use the last two stars of the Big Dipper to help you find those main directions. But the Big Dipper is kind of like a Swiss Army knife. It has a lot of handy little guides. And uh, another one of those is actually related to the handle of the Big Dipper. So if you can see the handle of the Dipper and you follow it, it kind of makes an arc. So we like to call this the Arc to Arcturus. So Arcturus is a super nice bright star. It's the fifth brightest star in the night sky. So you really should have no trouble spotting this, but it helps to know which one is which when you look and you follow the handle of the Big, big Dipper. You kind of arc Arcturus. A lot of us remembered it. So Arcturus is, and I'm put up the stick figure of the constellation, and I'm going to let you think about it for a minute. You can put in the chat what do you think this is. Let's up for just a moment. What constellation or what uh, image do you think this is? So um, I, I usually hear quite a few interesting um, ideas. I, uh, sometimes I think this looks like a fish, you know, the, the angler fish that have the little light <laughs> on the front of it. A lot of times I kind of think it looks um, like that. Um, I have heard that this kind of looks like an ice cream cone, and that's kind of an easy shape to use your imagination <laughs> to see. I'm seeing some just kind of, uh, hmm, what could this possibly be in the comments here? So it turns out that this is the constellation called Bootes, and Bootes is, I know it's kind of a, a silly sounding name, but he is uh, called the Herdsman. And basically the job of uh, this, this man is to push the plow of the Big Dipper around the North Star. So as the Earth spins around giving us our daytime and nighttime, all of the stars appear to move around the North Star called Polaris. And the job of Bootes, the herdsman, is to kind of push the Big Dipper, or, and the, also known as the plow, kind of push it around that star. So a lot of interesting things uh, to look for um, in, in our nighttime sky. Lots of different stars and constellations. And then, of course, that planet Mars in the evening sky. If uh, you aren't able to get outside kind of right after sunset, if you're more of a night owl, when we get to the midnight sky, and this is also true all month, everything I'm showing you here, you're really going to get to see it all month long. Um, there are, there's kind of a, a 
hint of summer. Summer is coming. <laughs> and uh, I know we have we had kind of a bit of a cold spell somewhat recently, but a good, uh, you know, something to look forward to for those of you who love summer is something called the Summer Triangle. So these are three bright stars. They are part of three separate constellations. Deneb, which is part of Cygnus the Swan. We have Vega, which is part of Lyra the Lyre or Heart and Altair, which is part of Aquila the Eagle. So those three bright stars, um, they're super easy to see. You'll see them starting, uh, they rise around midnight earlier in the month, and you will get to see those, um, and, and they'll get you know higher up as the month goes on and as we get into summer. There is also a winter triangle, uh, but of course that's behind us. We wanna focus on summer now. So you can also look for that. Okay, so that was kind of the early evening, middle of the night kind of sky. Um, the, the next part uh, for our show here is for our early birds. We're really, really, really big night owls. So for, for this month, for May, super early in the morning, kind of right before the sun comes up, maybe about an hour or so in the hour before the sun rises, there are actually two planets that um, you can spot in the sky. So I've put up a, a marker for one of them, but I'm gonna ask you to see if you can spot the second one. So I'll leave this here for just a moment. Where do we think the second could be? So this one's a, a pretty easy because Right now, in May, they're right next to each other. So we've got nice, bright Jupiter. Bright because it's covered in super shiny clouds and it's really big, really big gas giant planet. And then the second one is Saturn. So we actually have both of these planets. Um, and actually, you could say there are, back up just a little bit, you could say you can see three planets at once because you've got Jupiter on the left, Saturn on the right, and then Earth down at your feet. So you can see this really cool three planets at the same time before the sun rises. As um, the springtime and the summer continues on, these will start rising earlier in the evening. So we'll see them uh, kind of in the middle of the night uh, as, as the months move on. But for now, we have uh, these planets rising uh, right before the sun. So as always, because we are a planetarium team, we like to think at these planets. So we are going to start by flying to Saturn, which normally would take us 10 years, but now we uh, can get there much <laughs> faster. And we're going to take a look at, um, this is my favorite, favorite part of Saturn. It is so cool and it's really weird, which is probably why I like it. So I'm going to pause it right here. So what we're looking at right now, um, the colors are uh, kind of more exaggerated to help see the difference between everything. But we're looking at the North Pole of Saturn. So the reason it looks weird and it's kind of flowing around and everything is because Saturn is a gas giant planet, meaning it's really big, but it's made mostly of gas. This is all those uh, colors and swirls and everything are really just Stra strips and bands of hydrogen and helium swirling around as the planet turns, which the, a day on Saturn is about 11 hours, so it's a pretty short day for such a giant planet, and it causes the wind and the atmosphere to swirl around. So what's happening at the North Pole, and the reason why this is so weird is because there is a hexagon. I'll trace it with my pointer here. There is a hexagon at the North Pole of Saturn. Again, Saturn is made mostly of gas. This is not land, that's not rock, that's gas. And why is it a hexagon? Gas does not normally have corners, right? When the wind blows outside, it does not you know, <laughs> make a corner like that. This is really weird. And we actually don't know why that's happening. So here's a, a more a realistic view of it, but that's, this is something that scientists are still trying to answer. Why is there a hexagon shape? Why are there corners in this gas planet? Um, one of the main ideas that uh, scientists are kind of going with for now is that there's a storm at each one of those corners causing the gas to kind of flip by it and make that little turn there. But this is maybe one of you watching it tonight 
we'll uh, be able to figure this out in the future. So that's something uh, to look forward to, one of the big mysteries about uh, this awesome planet. So I've already mentioned a couple times that it's a gas giant, that it's really big. So if we compared Earth to Saturn, see that Saturn is definitely much larger. Um, if we, you know, if we got kind of Saturn in half and we lined up Earths across them, you'd fit about nine so that's how much bigger uh, this planet is, which means that there's a lot for us to learn and to think about and to try to figure out. So we sent a spacecraft called Cassini. Uh, this launched in 1997, and this uh, spacecraft took that 10-year trip out to Saturn, and then it spent 13 years studying the planet. But it didn't just kind of sit in one spot. It actually took many different kinds of trips, different orientations. It flew around different areas of Saturn because not only did we want to learn about these beautiful rings, Saturn has a lot of moons that we'll talk about in a moment. And then of course, weird mysteries like why is there, why is there a hexagon at, at the North Pole? How are uh, the clouds in the atmosphere, how are they behaving? What is it made of? Is there a way to find out what is underneath that atmosphere? So if I pause real quick, this grand finale here, um, this was the end of Cassini's mission. We didn't want to leave the spacecraft just kind of hanging out. We didn't want it to accidentally run into any uh, part of Saturn's rings or moons or anything. So. Um, gas giant planets like, like Saturn and Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune, the atmospheres of those planets are so deep that we don't know for sure what's under them. We, we don't really know what the, the core or the ground of these gas giant planets are. Scientists have an idea. We know there has to be something there. Um, right now, we, we kind of think that the core is rock and, and metal with some liquid um, hydrogen in, in the center, um, but, but we don't know for sure. So we sent Cassini, the spacecraft here, um, when it was finished collecting all of this data, all of these trips around Saturn, we tried to have it fly into the clouds and to get as much data as it could. Um, but remember that Saturn is a big swirling ball of gas. So uh, Cassini didn't get too far before it stopped working. So uh, it's still a mystery what's underneath those clouds, but hopefully one day uh, we'll be able to figure out um, what's going on under there. So we we learned so much from Cassini, getting you know those pictures of the, the North Pole, um, and then of course studying uh, the probably the most well-known feature Saturn, which are these rings, which, um, as some of you may know, Saturn's not the only planet with rings, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune also, but the rings of Saturn are unique because they're very wide. You could fit about four and a half Earths across Saturn, so they're very wide, and they're also made of millions of pieces of ice. And ice is super reflective. A lot of light bounces off the surface um, of ice versus the dusty rings of the other three gas giants. Um, Cassini also helped to discover not only are there pieces of ice in the rings, but there are moons. Cassini found four moons that just kind of live in the rings of Saturn. Um, before we sent Cassini out there, we didn't know um, why there were kind of gaps in the ring. And it turns out that uh, those moons, which are bigger than the chunks of ice, they've kind of pushed all that ice out of the way and created their own little paths. So if I pause this like right here, um, before we sent that Cassini spacecraft out there, just using telescopes, we could tell there were gaps in the rings. We had no idea why they were there. So by sending that spacecraft out to get much closer to Saturn and take time to study it, we actually discovered four moons that we didn't they're pretty small, so that's why we couldn't really see them um, from Earth telescopes. Um, but this moon that we're looking at here is not pretty small. This is Saturn's largest moon. Um, this is the second largest moon in the whole solar system. It's called Titan. So Titan, really big. Um, this is bigger than Mercury. It's one of the only moons bigger than the planet Mercury. It's pretty cool. Um, here's Cassini again. While it was on its mission, it dropped a tiny little probe called the Huygens probe um, down onto Titan. The reason that a probe was sent there is because this is the only moon with an atmosphere, substantial atmosphere. Um, 
And this is kind of what the surface of Titan looks like. So if you take a moment, look at what you can see, what you observe, what does it kind of look like is going on on this moon, and you probably are thinking it looks like there is water. So there is indeed liquid here, but Titan is actually super cold. It is 300 degrees below zero um, on that moon. I'm going to back up just a minute there. Um, so yeah, it's 300 degrees below zero here. So it's very cold. So this is not actually water. Uh, this is liquid methane. So it's cold enough that methane forms as a liquid here. Lakes and things, um, all of this atmosphere, it's not oxygen, but there's plenty of carbon, which is a basis for life. All life that we know of is carbon-based. So even though it is super, super cold on this moon, because there's an atmosphere and there's a liquid methane cycle, really similar to our water cycle here on Earth, there's carbon, there's a chance that life could live or exist on this moon Titan. Probably not humans, at least, you know, for now, but there could be some kind of life that could survive here. So not only do we look at other planets for the possibility of life, like Mars, we also like to um, investigate moons of other planets. So speaking of other planets, let's go ahead and talk about the second planet that you can see in the early morning sky. This is, of course, Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. So big that even the storms on this planet can be bigger than Earth. So we're kind of looking right here. We put Earth above what's called the Great Red Spot, which is basically a giant hurricane that is potentially more than 400 years old. So just, you know, take a moment to be happy that hurricanes on Earth do not last for 400 years. That would be awful. Uh, and th the reason, very similar to Saturn, the reason that Jupiter has these giant storms like this is because a day on Jupiter is actually even shorter. It is about nine hours. So uh, if you lived on Jupiter, your whole day would just be work or school. You'd get nothing done. So it's nice that we have slightly longer days, even though I'm sure, as a lot of you would agree, it would be great if we had more time in the day. But <laughs> taking a look uh, kind of at Jupiter from a little farther away, um, just before we keep going, uh, this kind of faint dark line might be kind of hard to see, but that is how thin and hard to see the rings of Jupiter are. They're there, but they're much, much, much harder to see than those beautiful, bright, wide uh, rings of Saturn. Just wanted to point that out. Um, Jupiter, if we wanted to compare Earth to that, uh, it is uh, larger than Saturn. It's the biggest planet of our entire solar system. So if we lined up Earths across, we would get even more. We could actually put 11 Earths across Jupiter. So that's how big it is. Again, mostly made of gas, even deeper atmosphere. So again, we're not completely sure what's going on under there. We think Jupiter, though, has a core of liquid hydrogen metal. Um, there's probably a lot of pressure and a lot of heat underneath all of that gas there. Um, kind of cool about Jupiter, because it is so big, a lot of moons are able to exist in orbit around there. Um, Jupiter does have four quite large moons called the Galilean moons. So these are those four Galilean moons. Um, they're big enough that if you do have a telescope, you might be able to spot those next to Jupiter in the sky. Um, they'll look like tiny little dots next to Jupiter, but there's a chance you can see them with a telescope, which is really cool. Um, they were named, as you might guess, uh, after Galileo. He was the first one to spot those in his early telescope models. So one of, um, actually we're going to talk about two. Let's talk about two of these Galilean moons. Um, this one is my favorite, my favorite moon, because it looks super weird. If you haven't guessed, I like weird things. But the reason that Io looks like this, right, it kind of looks like a weird pizza, or I don't even know. You let us know what you think, <laughs> what you think this looks like in the comments here. But it's covered in just weird spots and splotches. And that is because Io, which, by the way, it's, you know, as you saw, it's spelled like it sounds. Really easy moon uh, to spell. If you're in a spelling bee and you get Io, congratulations. <laughs> That's super lucky to get. Um, so this moon here, the reason that it's covered in all those splotches is because this moon has a molten inside. It has volcanoes all over the place. Um, there's a, a really big, actually, difference in temperature 
around Io. Um, at these volcanoes, which are spewing out this molten iron and all this lava, all those volcano areas, it's like 300 degrees there. But anywhere that you're not close to those volcanoes, because Io doesn't really have an atmosphere, it's super cold. It's negative 200 degrees on some spots of Io, but then it gets to 3,000 degrees in other spots. So we've got this super wide range of temperature and activity. You might even notice there is a huge kind of plume of, of stuff coming out of Io2 that is sulfur coming out from under the surface there, um, and it creates a nice thin, thin sulfur atmosphere around this moon here. So because this moon is covered in volcanoes and all this stuff, uh, really unlikely that any kind of life would be able to survive on Io. Um, the reason that this is happening, Io has actually the youngest surface. It has the most volcanically and geologically active surface of any object in our solar system. The reason for that is because Io is basically in a tug of war. You have giant Jupiter, which is 1300 times bigger than Earth. You have giant Jupiter on one side, and then Jupiter has 79 moons, and a lot of them are further away than Io is. So you have the gravity pulling from Jupiter on one side, and then all these other moons on the other, and it's kind of pulling back and forth on Io, and it's causing it to kind of fluctuate like this, which makes the inside super hot and molten, and that's why it's continuously erupting over and over again. So it's probably not a very pleasant life that Io has, um, but maybe maybe it likes it. Like it's getting pulled back and forth, kind of like it's dancing. I don't know. I think about that, but that's why. We have this super interesting um, active surface on uh, this moon of Jupiter. So kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from a very hot moon, we come to another moon of Jupiter. This is Europa. So if I pause right here and give you a moment to look here, yeah, this is, um, as you might notice, one of my favorite things to do is to just have you observe and look. What do you think you're seeing here? What do you notice? What could we be looking something you probably notice are all of these kind of scratches on the surface of this moon. It's got those kind of reddish cracks there. So it turns out that this moon Europa is covered in ice. This is water ice and there are cracks in that ice because below this solid ice surface is an ocean. So there is water underneath this ice surface on a moon, this is a moon of Jupiter covered in an ocean, maybe even more than twice the amount of water that Earth has right here on this moon of Jupiter. So water, again, another really important aspect for life. So there's a chance that maybe under that deep ice of, of Europa, maybe there's life there. Um, it's, it's very difficult uh, to send missions out. Uh, you know, it's very expensive to build robots to fly out to space. It takes five years to fly to Jupiter and to have something maybe safely landed, drill down under this thick uh, ice core. Um, so, but that, that could be something that NASA, you know, plans to do. There's an, a, a plan to send a mission back to Titan, that moon of Saturn, to investigate more what's going on on the surface. So maybe in the future, we'll send something to Europa to maybe drill down under that ice and see what's going on uh, in that ocean. So what do you think? Is that something worth uh, exploring? Should we go to Europa? Um, awesome. So we are almost out of time, but there's one more thing that we want to talk to you about because in the May sky, near the end of the month, there is actually an eclipse occurring. And this one is especially for uh, our friends who are on the West Coast. If anyone right now is watching from the West Coast, um, you will get a, a, a much better picture of this eclipse um, from here in, in New York. In New Jersey and on the East Coast, and we probably won't get as, uh, you may not even notice an eclipse happening, um, but a lot of places will live, you know, live stream, we'll try to get you um, some images of it. There will be a lot of places for you to look and find. And then those of you in uh, the right spot for this eclipse, so we're flying us over here to California now, um, 
the, the best places to view are in uh, Australia, parts of Alaska and Hawaii, kind of in that area. Um, but if you're in the right place or if you're watching a, a stream, maybe, um, you'll actually see what is a, a lunar eclipse. I'll pause right here. This is also known as the blue moon. And now it's not because there is blood on the moon. It's because the moon takes on this kind of deep reddish color. The reason for that, I know when uh, we've if you've heard of eclipses before, you might think that the moon gets completely dark and we won't even be able to see it. Uh, but what actually happens is the moon takes on that reddish color, and that is all thanks to the Earth's atmosphere. So it's really good that we have an atmosphere. It's what helps us breathe and everything. Um, when the light from the sun passes through the atmosphere in our Earth, it splits the light, just like a prism, splits that into a rainbow. And the red light is the one that passes, it happens to line up exactly, and it passes right over our moon, giving the moon that reddish color. So this type of eclipse happens when you have the uh, Earth pass between, exactly between the sun and the moon, and that sunlight passes through the Earth's atmosphere at the edges. And it gets split, and the red part is what covers falls on our so this um, is, is going to be, again, most visible from our friends over on the East Coast. Um, there is still an eclipse happening, that's called a penumbral eclipse, but that's really, really hard for you to notice with your eyes um, from over here. Um, but you can know that it's happening. There's an eclipse occurring on the 26th. Um, and then because uh, this is happening, the next uh, moon cycle, so halfway through the lunar cycle, there'll be a new moon on June 10th, and that is going to be the basis of a solar eclipse. So kind of the opposite, when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, that's going to be occurring on June 10th. Um, and again, we won't see the total one from New Jersey, but we will definitely see um, almost, and we'll see a really good... Um, view for a lunar eclipse you do not need any sort of eye safety the one i'm showing you now for the solar eclipse on june 10th you do need to make sure you have a nice protective eyewear um, even during an eclipse even though um, this is called an annular solar eclipse so it's actually when the moon is a bit closer to us than at other times and it won't completely cover the sun but it still will pass between there you definitely, anytime you're looking at anything that has to do with the sun, you want to make sure um, that you have a proper safe wear. So, lots of stuff uh, to look at in our sky. Um, I'm going to take a moment just to see if there are uh, any, any last uh, comments. Let's see. Andrew's think, doing a great job as always <laughs> answering um, our question here. I love, thank you so much, a lot of you letting uh, me know all of your observations, all the things that you noticed about those moons, different things we're looking at. Um, great question, Nicole. Do you think we'd be able to drink the water on uh, that moon? And that's a really good question. So as far as we know, I mean, other water out there in space, like the, the ocean on Europa, um, I, you know, can't, can't say for sure. It's probably very similar to water um, that we would find on Earth, but just, just similar to water on Earth, we can't drink all the water here either. So that's definitely something um, that is worth investigating because that might sound great, right? That could be a good water source for humans in the future, although it would uh, take a long time to <laughs> to get that water from there to here. But that could be a, a really awesome um, way to, to provide water to, to Earth. So definitely something that is worth investigating and figuring out. For right now, we are only really able to use um, something called spectroscopy. So using specific kind of cameras on board um, telescopes and, and the, the satellites we send out to these planets, uh, specific types of filters on cameras that can actually help figure out what the different um, elements are on things like Europa. Um, so yeah, great question. It'll be, of course, easier the more we get, the more, uh, closer we get to sending a spacecraft mission to the moon to help figure that out. That was probably a very long-winded way of me answering that question as a maybe, which is kind of what uh, a lot of um, 
what a lot of astronomy <laughs> questions are. Um, great. So um, I think as far as I can see, we are pretty good with questions. Thank you again so much for asking awesome questions. Thanks, Andrew, for being on top and, and providing um, great responses to those. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you get a chance to see uh, the planets in the different times of night, um, some of those awesome constellations you can spot. And um, I hope you all have a great May, and um, we look forward to seeing you back for our next online planet next month or you know feel free to come see us liberty science center is open thursday through sunday and you'll either see me mike or andrew there given show so we'd love to have you come say hi um and to let us know that you're you watch us online all right so thank you so much everyone have a great rest of your evening and we will see you